hope she's not able to hear any of that. I know. You better get that stuff. I can't. I believe it is a living document. There's been 26 amendments over the years that make it a living document. It's where the founders or our are elected officials have determined that there has been uh, something wrong with it that needs to be fixed. Part of that is the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Without that, 15 of you people here would not have the right to vote. So I think it is a living document. It has to be interpreted as to the time. It also has to be amended by both houses of Congress and signed by the president. It has been has done so 26 times. I, I, I would just kind of like to add to that a little bit. The Constitution in itself does provide the mechanism by which it can be changed and modified, but that has nothing to do with it being a living document. That has nothing to do with its interpretation. When we amend the Constitution, it's because of the very first sentence in it to form a more perfect union. We find errors that the Constitution knew we would find as society matured and moved forward. It is applicable to all times. It is applicable to all technologies. And if we find a way to make our union more perfect, we have the mechanism in the amendments to do that. And I stand by my, if those amendments make it a living document, it's not frozen in time. Yes, what, sir. What is your definition of a living document? A living document is a document that can be changed if it's deemed for the better for the majority of people and the people that it affects. I think her question was more of what uh, uh, some past administrations wanted to do with the Constitution without actually following the rules and changing it. And the in Supreme other words, Court, make it liquid. Yeah, and the Supreme Court usually comes in and fixes that. Through the holding of the laws on the Constitution. Uh, I would just, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, we, we need uh, the Supreme Court. It needs to be the way it is. Uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the political climate of the day discussing expanding the court uh, because they don't like certain decisions. I think those are uh, those are dangerous tactics. Those are extremely dangerous thought processes, and we need to respect the decisions of the Supreme Court, just as we respect the laws passed by Congress and signed by the President. I agree with that. Yes, sir. Um, so, with the whole um, abortion issue, um, going over the Constitution being like a living document. Um, it's in terms of it being a document that is dead as in essentially like you need to interpret it the way it was interpreted um, you also have to like interpret it based on the values of the founders and that sort of thing I believe um, like the right to abortion was based on some sort of you know it was in the penumbras and the emanations and they were talking to, they, they like drew it from like some sort of right to privacy something like that um but that's an example of them treating it as a living document and interpreting it the way that of the times not their times because if they interpret it in their times they would have interpreted the constitution as like you know um life is life and they would have recognized the way the founders viewed life which is you know uh, from a christian standpoint and so um that's what that's my understanding of like interpreting the constitution you have to yeah it can be amended of course um if it's not the bible you know the constitution is not gospel but um but um it needs to be understood and interpreted from the founder's perspective not from the current perspective like if we were to i don't know like um their definition of men is like mankind or something like that. Um, we can't like misinterpret that and then claim that they were only speaking about like males, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's just, uh, 
calling it a living document is to me it means interpreting the words and the phrases that they used and how we use it today not that it can't not be amended does that make sense i'm not sure i know what your question is i was just trying to make a, a point okay Constitution, I read it as to the context of as a federal agent, what situation am I in and how can I best not violate the Constitution? So you're reading it, you're, you're taking today's and you're, interpre you're interpreting today instead of, this is for the meaning of it instead of the, the original intent of the document. Yeah, because there were no machine guns back in 1776. Yeah, it doesn't there matter. were no there hand grenades, also, there were no. Uh, there were military grade weapons. You have yeah, military hands. grade weapons. Okay, you could have uh, your own hands. Muskets and that sort of stuff were the, were the big issue. As a federal agent, I had to look at that, and I'm looking at a box of uh, squad assault rifles that we've done a case on, and I have to look at that and go, okay, how does this, how does the Constitution affect me here, and how do I best handle this? And usually it's due process. So how, how would you interpret the Second Amendment when it comes to military-grade weapons? I think that uh, fully automatic weapons are uh, not allowed under the Gun Control Act of 1968. Is that constitutional, though? I don't know. Um, I get into the first. Not, as abortion, military-grade weapons and abortion are not mentioned in the Constitution. They are under arms. No, they're not. Military-grade military grade weapons are not the arms the protected by the Second Amendment were military-grade. They were not. A, a well-armed militia and the right of the people to bear arms. They had no idea that military weapons would be such prevalent as they are today. Do I think military weapons should be banned? Is that what you're asking me? Yes. I um, think that if they're fully automatic, they probably should be. Semi-automatic, I do not. So, so the, I got a question. Wait a second. Let him finish. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the point of the Second Amendment is to arm the citizens as equal to the government. Would you agree? It doesn't say that, no. I wouldn't agree with that. It what says that um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, that seems pretty clear. Uh, the point being that the founders knew that if the government was stronger and more armed than its people, then it could subdue them, right? I, I don't argue with you there. And so, just, so therefore, like, um, the Second Amendment allowed for cannons for, like, merchant ships. It allowed for um, muskets, which were military-grade weapons at the time. They were cutting edge at the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, in effect, the whole gun should be banned. It's not protected under the Second Amendment. It doesn't make any sense because the purpose is that the Second Amendment allows citizens to have military-grade weapons. I mean, to say that they they, they saw so that, or they saw see? muskets as like, you know, oh, you ineffective know? and... Oh, do you have an M4? I do, yeah. No, I have two. They're military-grade military grade weapons. Is your, yours fully automatic? No. Mine is not either, and I support you for having that weapon. And if it was fully automatic, would I support you? No, because it's a gun control act. But I believe that act is unconstitutional. Then sort of get all of your uh, U.S. representatives and senators and have them fix it. May I follow up? Yes, sir. What would be your reason for not wanting a fully automatic weapon to be in the hands of civilians? Because I've seen too many people use them in okay. bad circumstances to kill too many people. It's not the gun's fault. It's not the gun's fault, but it's the, the ability of the person to get to the gun automatic? that's the fault. Against the people? Huh? Have people. you seen the government misuse fully automatic weapons against the people? I saw. Um, I saw Waco. Saw that happen. Lost a friend there. Um, I think it was handled poorly. There are better ways that they could have handled that, knowing that Koresh came out of that compound twice a week to get the mail. We got him at the post office and did what they needed to do. So, what does "shall not be infringed" mean to you? 
that you could keep them there on as long as they don't go against the gun control. All right, guys, we've run out of time for Ed on that question, so let's switch for the same question. <laughs> well, the other the other can the other person needs to answer the question as well. Oh no, they can both jump in. I'll, I'll just make mine real quick. Okay. okay? Uh, my position is that the Second Amendment was not a backdoor uh, pat on the back to hunters. The Second Amendment was done to do two things. First, it was to allow people to defend themselves, their family, their body, and their property. Secondly, it was designed to be the ultimate backstop to an overreaching government intent on eliminating or degrading our natural rights. Yes. So would it, so do the civilians need a fully automatic weaponry to be able to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Mr. Byers, so um, if you were just shaking your head just now with John saying that they should be able to be able to protect themselves from an overreaching government. Um, just like you were agreeing with that statement with Waco and, um, you know, you know Ruby, Ruby Whitridge just a couple of weeks before the incidents of Waco, which was completely mishandled, but that's a completely different conversation. But let me ask you this. If a military-grade weapon is fully automatic and the, and the purpose of the Second Amendment is to keep the civilians safe from an overreaching government, how are we supposed to keep ourselves safe from an overreaching government without government military grade issue weapons? As I said, you need to contract your U.S. representative and your U.S. senator and have the Gun Control Act of 1968 amended. That's not my question, though. My question isn't how we can change that. My question, though, is why do you see fit that that, is not, that should not be allowed? Why do you think that that should not be because allowed? Because they're weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so let me ask you this. What happens when the government comes knocking on your door wanting to take your family's guns and trying to keep your family under their shield and trying to disrupt your life? What are you, what are you going to do then? I have no automatic weapons in my house or no prohibited weapons in my house. Okay. So as long as you comply, it's not a problem? I have none. I have no need for them. I've been in, been in numerous critical no incidents involving yet. gunfights. I've never had to use an automatic weapon. We depend on our police to keep us from being in that problem. Yeah, you know, yeah. like we depend on them standing for our constitutional rights. If they are part of the government, how can we suppose that they're not going to overreach? Yeah, exactly. I got a question. Where do you guys draw weapons, automatic, semi-automatic, single shot, whatever? Where do you guys draw the line on what is considered to bear arms? If I had an F-16 bombs and a machine guns on it, it's a weapon. You have guns on it. Do you draw a line there or grenade? What do you consider a weapon? A grenade is not a firearm, of course. We know that. Or a landmine or something like that. How do you guys interpret that right to bear arms? I mean, what, what defines that arms to you? So I, I think, make sure I understand your question, is where is that line in the sand where once you cross that line that's no longer, quote, an arm, that becomes an army? Is that? Not so much just an army, just as an individual, or just an arm. Okay. What would you consider the definition of arms? Okay, so I, I'm going to answer the question the way I think you're asking it. Uh, I don't see any. I don't see any limit to what you, as a free, sovereign American citizen, should be able to own. If you can afford an F-16 and you can put gas in it and you have a place to park it, by God, let's go for a ride. Yeah. 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 I would interpret it under the existing regulations by the state of Indiana and the United States government. Uh, you're, uh, civilians are not allowed to own military craft that still have weapons attachments or weapons on them. Um, that's the federal law. What about other types of, quote, as I said, it just says arms. It doesn't specifically define a side piece or a revolver or pistol or a fire. You mentioned hand rifle. grenades? Pardon me? You mentioned hand grenades, didn't you? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, how how would you Yeah, that's qualify? considered a oh, weapon of mass destruction, and, and I believe there's a state and federal law against it. Uh, 
Uh, where do you draw the line uh, with what's considered as a weapon of mass destruction? It's it's defined in law. You what can is look it up. What is your definition? Yeah, My I mean, definition? I think I want to know yours. I what would go to the to the book and look. You know, it's not up to me to to put my personal opinion as I enforce the law. I don't think that's what they're asking. I think that what they're asking is where do you draw the line? And where I'm saying, he's my answering. reply is, is that I'm going to look under the law and see what it is. I'm not going to make a personal judgment call. I'm going to look under the law and see what they tell me it is. So th this is it, it kind of the Jen Saki circle back here. Uh, <laughs> this is why I think it's important that we're having this discussion because uh, Mr. Byers is talking about following the law. And the example that I would use with federal law enforcement, what, which law did they follow, was Katrina. Katrina. The hurricane in New Orleans. Um, you know, we, we had federal agents going from house to house with no authority to confiscate firearms. And we, we can talk about specific examples of that happening. And this is why I think we need a sheriff that is strong on constitutional law and understands that regardless of what a federal agent comes into our county and tells the sheriff to do, he's going to stand his ground and say, no, we may have had a major hurricane, there may be major destruction, so you do not have the right as the federal government to go from house to house and confiscate firearms. Was that illegal and when I they did that? It was illegal, but they did it. So it was against the law? It is against the okay. law. Okay, so I, if I someone was protecting the law, that would not have happened, right? I'm sorry? If someone had been protecting the law, then that couldn't Absolutely. have happened. That's why we want to make sure that our sheriff knows the law, uh -huh. understands the law, and is committed to following it, regardless of who's telling him what to do. And I agree. I agree with that. I've seen federal agents abused too much in my own time as a federal agent. Trust them. Uh, I will never work with the Secret Service or the FBI because of that reason. Um, people's individual rights should be respected, and it should be respected under the color of law. Yes, Both of you guys well said. <laughs> so you're saying you're going to protect our right to bear arms? Yes, ma'am. Legal arms? Yes, ma'am. Even though the feds come in and tell you we're going to... I won't be an employee of the feds. I'll be the county sheriff. And under the Indiana Constitution, it plainly says that you as a citizen of Indiana can bear a firearm for your own self defense. It goes beyond that of the Constitution. You have That's beautiful. No Very nice. Automatic, whatever. Like I said, if it's an automatic if it's an automatic rifle or an automatic machine pistol, then I will go to the Gun Control Act and see what it currently says. So are we saying if it's legal, yeah. you'll support it? If you're carrying, say, say you're carrying a uh, a Glock 26, 9 millimeter compact, much like the one I'm carrying right now. If you were to carry that, and uh, a federal agent came to me and said, you need to take that from her because she's got a concealed weapon, my response would be, get out of the county or I'll arrest you. You're acting beyond the color of your law and beyond the Indiana state law. Get out. That is the definition between the two. A semi-automatic is not a, a fully uh, assault automatic. Assault rifle is actually a uh, type of design. came from the Armalite 15, which means right. AR-15. Yeah. Uh, my personal preference is I prefer the battle rifles. I prefer the uh, M14s and the Mini-14s. I think they're easier to use in a combat situation because your field of view is much more wide open. You can hold the weapon down at, at low ready, and you can scan, and then when you have target identification, bring it up with you. Hard to do that with you. That's just so my you would not consider an assault rifle as a weapon of mass destruction? I'm sorry, one more time? You would not consider the assault rifle the, the if it's, weapon If it's a semi-automatic rifle, I would not. No, ma'am. You would not? Okay. That or a shotgun. Either. I was just, just checking. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. If you ever carried an M14 and all the ammunition you need in 100 degree <laughs> weather, yes. day and night, yes, sir. you might change your mind. M I, I carried an M16, and I love that little guy. I was the prototype for the National Park Service.
first when we went to Arrival. We originally, we eventually went to many Portines, but I carried an M14 at Sorrel National Monument, 60 miles north of Mexico in the desert. So I'm very, very familiar with the weight and uh, the heat with it. But I like the rifle. I mean, I just liked it better. And we went with the Mini 14s because they were a little bit lighter. And I like them. I like the battle rifle configuration more than I do the AR. That's just personal preference. That's it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Wait. Did you? No. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> We'd like to give them both a chance to I talk at this. I had a quick question. If the like the law was changed, would you support civilians owning weapons like uh, an F-16 with? Guns and bombs. If the law changed, yeah. yeah. If the law changed, who am I to put my personal opinions about okay. the law? Yeah. Cool. I might look for one myself. I went anywhere to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Too so, many Harleys in the garage. Yes, sir. So if the law changed, to I'm where... sorry. Wait a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> am I the one that's supposed to be making sure that I happens? <laughs> So if the law changed to where semi-automatics are illegal, would you think about, is it really a weapon of mass destruction, or because they label it, you would support the banning of it? Good question. If, let me repeat that to make sure I understand what you're asking. You're saying if a semi-automatic weapon is made illegal, would I support that law? Is that what you're saying? Could would you, you change your thing? definition of a weapon of mass destruction? Yeah, basically. To, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change my personal definition at all. No. And if the law changed, um, you would support, like, uh, confiscation of, like, semi-automatic weapons or something like that? I would not. Even if the law changed? Yeah, I would not. Uh, what would you do? I don't do? see Indiana changing that law. And if the federal government wants to come down to it, they're on their own. So why would that be un or unconstitutional with the banning of automatic rifles? You're asking me to comment on a what if in the future, and that's hard to do. I don't think that the state of Indiana would would uh, would ban them, and I, I seriously don't think that, that the United States government would either. For every 100 people in the United States, there's 120 guns. Uh, it's just too many out there. There's like 67, 63 million assault rifles out there right now. It's just way too many to try to confiscate. Let's let's change that question a little bit, and uh, let's use the same question, but let's use different scenarios and different items. So, uh, because I think this is something that we probably have coming down the pike. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a Supreme Court essentially say that the right to an abortion does not exist within the Constitution. And we understand that in the state of Indiana on July 25th, we're going to have a special session with our General Assembly and chances are very high that they will make abortion illegal in the state of Indiana. And part of the language of that law could very possibly be that the sheriff is charged with the responsibility of preventing federal agents from coming in and trying to impose federal regulations on an Indiana law. And uh, so this is something that could happen within the within this month, within 30 days. And I think it's fair to ask Mr. Byers, so Indiana uh, passes that anti-abortion law and charges you with the responsibility of preventing federal agents from coming in and preventing that law from taking effect. At that point, are you going to be loyal to uh, the state law? Or are you going to allow the federal agents to come in and impose? Mr. Colburn's asking me a very nebulous what if in the future. I can say this, that if uh, a state law is in, in uh, conflict with a federal law, there's a doctrine called Supreme Sovereign, and you can Google that. And Supreme Sovereign says that the federal law takes precedence. Um, it does not state, however, that a county sheriff or a local police department has to assist any federal agency in the performance of the federal agency's job. Quite frankly, we have enough stuff going on with the jail and with uh, the lack of response in the county right now, the sheriff's department, those are my main priorities. I'm not too worried about the rest of them. Absolutely. 
I'm gonna kind of like put it in reverse a little bit. So he was just talking about uh, when you support, um, if the law had changed on semi-automatic rifles, and, or what you consider assault rifles, or um, handguns, like the Glock 29, which you just mentioned, 90mm compact, what, if that law changed, you said you would still, you would not support the federal agents coming into confiscated, correct? That's correct. Okay, so what changed between the assault, the fully automatic, and the semi-automatic? The danger to the public. There's not much difference, though, because, so I mean, you can look at, there are bump stocks which can allow you to shoot quicker, and, they're and now, then people they're now, can pull the they're trigger. They're now banned. Uh, you can tell that to Evaldi, you can tell that to uh, Buffalo, you can tell that to people that were assaulted. It's um, not the gun that's the problem. It's very true. Guns are only tools. That's the only thing we are. I think that's... I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I said Uvalde was because of the police That's right. I mean, that's what it was. Well, and we had an individual that had two mental health issues that was allowed to purchase a weapon. Because it was never reported. Because yeah. the police officers, again, didn't do their job. Yeah. Precisely. Okay, are you so done, ma'am? So how effective are the gun laws that are on the books? I mean, if the guns aren't the problem with the person, how effective are background checks and making sure that the guns don't fall into the hands of the wrong people? My opinion would be that they can be very effective if they're utilized. Uh, let's, let's keep running with the Uvalde situation. Uh, not only uh, I'm not an expert on Uvalde. I haven't seen any of the documentation. All I'm going by are <laughs> news reports, right? So uh, my understanding is that the police were, had been called on this kid once or twice. Those reports weren't correctly made. But more importantly, we had a father that allowed his underage son to buy those guns with his permission. So, I mean, we have a number of breakdowns in this situation, and I don't believe that the it was lack of gun control. I don't believe it was lack of gun laws. It was a lack of people doing the right thing. And for us to have a government that steps up and says, well, we need to infringe more on the Second Amendment because of Uvalde, I think is it, it's just short-sighted and ill thought out. And I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that, man. I, the, the current gun laws as there are now are very ineffective. Uh, a person can be turned down to purchase a weapon at Rule King and he can go to the 4-H ground to a gun show or go to a roadside guide during the, the fall where they're, they're having roadside sales, pick up a, a weapon. Buy it online legally. Yeah, you can, you can go to a friend and, and get one. Um, as it is, the laws themselves are not real effective. I've never thought that. Um, what I do think, however, is that as, a, as an instance, as a U.S. Customs Special Agent, I was assigned to ATF to help them with the backlog of Nick's National Institute of Background Checks in North Carolina and we went to a place that was on the east coast of North Carolina it was an old black guy that had a, a felony for drunkenness when he was probably 18 years old and he was now like 80 and he had a, a revolver and he used to pawn that revolver each time he'd get money and he'd go back and pay him to get the money back kind of like a, a long term loan we got called in because somebody ran the serial number on the revolver and ran the guy and the guy came back to felony Way we handled that was we just uh, we told the individual said here here's 50 bucks and you know keep the gun sell it to him and, you know be done with it. That's how we handled that to keep him from getting in trouble. But the laws aren't real effective as he as Colton said. It's a family issue. Sometimes you've got to help the guys grow up and kids and say no you can't have a gun or your spouse if you can't have a gun or you need to call. Hey this has been a domestic violence situation that person has a weapon. He or she has a weapon. We, we need, it needs to be taken away from. Them. And so there are red flag laws, but they're just not real effective. For the actions of their kids. I'm sorry, ma'am. A little louder. Should parents be held accountable for the actions of their kids? Yeah, until sure they're 18, and then the individual should be held accountable. For the future. Depends on the kid. The kid. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. I, I, you know, 
obviously I have a 16-year-old uh, son and a 10-year-old daughter, and I take full responsibility for their actions and how they're growing up to be productive adults and the good and the bad. And But there is no way that today I'm going to go out and buy my son a, uh, and I, I don't know anything about guns, an AR-15 or an M4 or M1. I, I'm not going to buy him that, that firearm because I don't think he's ready for it. Now, when he is 18, 21, or whatever that age is, when he gets there, if he has the wherewithal, then he can buy that. Change it up here. The right to privacy. Where would you guys draw the line of right to privacy? My home, if I'm living in a rental property, I'm in my camper, or in my automobile. Where does that right to privacy start and end? Good question. I like that question. Anywhere you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, that privacy, that right to privacy exists. Uh, and not being a lawyer, what I would say is that if you're in a rental home, an Airbnb, or you should have, uh, even in a restroom in a public building, you should have that right to privacy. Uh, and there should be some restrictions on what the internet people can see and collect from you. Uh, you know, we've got 30, 40 people here. I doubt if any of us have ever read every word in the terms and conditions of the phone when we turn it on. It's a brand new phone. Uh, you know, we, we, when we accept those terms and conditions, we sign away some of our rights to privacy. And I don't think that's, in practical terms, I don't think that's right. We should still have that reasonable expectation of privacy, even on the internet and with our cell phones. Is it our own choice to be on the internet, though? Like, is that infringing our amendment rights? Was, I understand that perspective, but wasn't it also your right to use a landline? And, you know, I think there were a number of court decisions who said that the federal government would have to get a search warrant to be able to tap that phone and listen to what you were saying. And I think that same test should apply to cellular telephones and the Internet. Well said, sir. Ed, would you like to answer that, too? Uh, uh, let me add well, to that. You, Ed, I left this part out. A okay. reasonable doubt, probable cause part of it when taking a traffic stop. If you're right to privacy, or even someone coming onto my property at my home, and then all of a sudden they suspect me, they, they try to qualify as reasonable doubt or probable cause. Uh, I, I, you think they should stop at that point, go back and explain it to a judge that signs that search warrant, or they should just be able to say, We think something's going on in your car, your house, or whatever? Another good question. I'm not, again, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but well, in my opinion... A, a traffic stop. I'm right. in my automobile. You know, is that private? Why I'm in that automobile, even though I'm on a public street? Uh, the police officer asks you where you're going, where you've been. Uh, you got a gun in your car. You got any illegal drugs or whatever. Again, I, I'm not a law enforcement officer, but my, my opinion is that that is is an extension of your personal residence and they do not have the right just to and, and legally they may legally according to a court they may have this right i'm not a law enforcement officer so i have no idea but in my opinion i don't think that they should have the right to say okay where are you going why are you out so late do you have can you get out so i can search your automobile for drugs to me your automobile is an extension of your private residence does the law support that answer? I do not know. Ed? Every place that you mentioned has a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you worked over here at Bruce's flooring and you had a locker in there with a lock on it, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that lock. Let's say you're on a, you're the victim, you, you are the subject of a traffic stop. You say you swerved or whatever, the police has, has reasonable suspicion to stop you. Let's say that he, you know, as he walks up, he looks into the car and sees something, something that shouldn't be there, or something that triggers something. That's called plain view doctrine. 
that the officer is at the spot where he or she is supposed to be doing here here her or his job and they have a right if they see something to question you on it do they have a right to, to ask where you've been and where you're going no they don't and you don't have to answer either you don't have to answer what amendment is that guys Fifth amendment. the fifth and there's uh, well there's actually about nine amendments that cover due process the fifth amendment That's is that against the right of uh, of uh, not testifying against yourself of course that can be a, that can be circumvented with a court order can i jump this question in i've been trying for a minute i'm sorry i want to switch gears just a hair you can go back uh and this is to again to both of you the 14th amendment how does that apply to policing specifically in what context? due process how does it apply to policing or does it apply to policing in your opinion uh, yeah, because I'm not a There's, law enforcement We have officer. 26 amendments to the Constitution. Nine of them, or roughly a third of them, deal with due process. Uh, due process is a method by which your rights are protected from the government, and that includes cops, so that you can't be just automatically arrested and put in jail without due process or probable cause. So those are very important rights to have. Some of the other uh, amendments that deal with it are the right to a speedy trial, the right to hear the accusation, the right to have a competent defense, and witnesses in your behalf, uh, the right to know what the evidence is that the, the prosecuting uh, authority is using against you. All those are part of your constitutional rights in due process, and there's nine of those in the 27th and the 27 amendments to the Constitution. Yes, don't, sir. Don't red flag laws violate that? I don't think so. I think that there's an overwhelming uh, use there for there's an overwhelming need for society to protect themselves from people that shouldn't have weapons. Yeah, They've had numerous uh, instances here in Charlestown and Clark County with, where uh, women have been killed because of, of um, husbands and, and domestic partners that were um, didn't pay any attention to, to that and they weren't properly done. Uh, I point to the uh, Jeffersonville cannibal that killed his girlfriend and then ate her, even though he'd been arrested and released and came back. and. You know, there's just things out there that go beyond what the scope of a normal cop can do. But I think red flag, law, red flag laws, they're not meant to, to deprive a person uh, permanently of their firearms. It's just until the heated situation is over. Or until the government that could theoretically be tyrannical decides to give them their right back. I'm sorry, one more time, I can't hear you. Or until the government that, in theory, could be tyrannical at that moment decides to give them... I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any that's happened. Uh, the red flag logs that, that have been uh, used that I wear, I'm aware of have been usually domestic violence incidents where they take the guns for three or four days. So, well, um, sorry. Um, let him... Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as red flag laws I, I go, I'm, I'm completely against them. I, I think they circumvent your due process uh, because they, they essentially are on one person's accusation. You don't have the opportunity to confront your accuser. You don't have the opportunity to consult with the lawyer. And they confiscate your personal property on the accusation of one person that you don't even get the opportunity to meet face to face. They they circumvent everything that he just said he supported. They don't they don't seize your weapons. They take them temporarily and you get them back within three days. They temporarily seize them. How do they, how do they get them back? Does the judge yeah, give them back? No, some, some states have judge. laws that specifically say after three days you must return this. Other ones have, have uh, uh, provisions by which the arresting officers or the seizing officers can go in and, and actually petition the court to keep the weapons away from them. Different states have different things. In Indiana, I believe they come back after three days. What protects the person that has the weapon? Well, the, well, that's the three day. Person. That's a three day extension. So for three days, they have no rights. Well, no, it's not they have no rights. They can get a lawyer and, and, and petition back. However, most states, including Indiana, allow them to go back within three days anyway. So you're absolutely fine with somebody losing or suspending their rights for three days. Except for those particular weapons, yes, ma'am, I am. That's the 14th okay, so Amendment due process. Let me ask you this then, sir. Uh, so let's say Billy Bob down the street has a problem with Johnny Boy. You have to speak up, son. I can't hear you. Sorry. Let's say. Johnny Boy down here has a problem with Billy Bob. Johnny Boy decides, you know what? This guy's going hunting. 
next week. I want to make his life absolute hell because, you know, he didn't pay me back for drinks, drinks last weekend. And he decides to say, hey, this guy's been up to some shady business. I've seen some cars laid at, there at night. I've heard him abuse his wife. What stops the government from, sorry, temporarily seizing their weapons? You know, what stops that? First off, it has to be it has to be a domestic partner, and he's not a domestic partner. If they go to the house and talk to the domestic partner, and he or she says, "No, nah, everything's good," then it ends there. Okay, but let's say it's the girlfriend who like found out that her boyfriend cheated on her or something. They'll go to the house and see if there is indeed any evidence that there was any type of domestic violence. If there's not, then they won't do anything. Okay. You've got to have you've got to have probable cause to do legal actions. Would they have the right, based on that, to go in the house to quick to do questioning? Not to search, no. They knock on the door. They can ask to be let in, but you don't have to let them in. And if they were told to leave? Huh? If they were told to leave? They should leave. They should leave. That's constitutional. You, yes, sir. sir. No. Do you want to answer? Oh, I... You I, got three whole minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's hard to fill up three minutes with... I do not support any red flag laws at all. <laughs> I do not support... No. Uh, again, I, I believe that red flag laws are circumventing your due process. And they, they're, in my opinion, unconstitutional and should not be used. And as American citizens with natural rights to self-protection and rights to our property, red flag laws circumvent those rights. And it's not correct. Are there laws already and implemented? I okay, go ahead. I say that there are due process due process safeguards within the red flag laws. That was my question. I was going to ask if you thought that there were already procedures in place that could circumvent. So. I, I, no, they're not adequate. How about that? They're inadequate. Good answer. So my question is this, is that an individual out on the street. Can you speak up, sir, a little bit? An individual is out on the street or in a public area and somebody in a house for business calls the cops and says somebody's out here on the street and they're doing things that I think are suspicious. And law enforcement shows up and they walk up and they ask who they are and, and, they, and they refuse to say who they are and ask, you know, what's this about? The officer says, well, I'm not right now I'm under doing an investigation. Uh, I need to see your driver's license. I need you to ID. Is that legal? I would say the individual has no, no right to be compelled to produce his license if he's not doing anything. A smart officer would pull up in his room for a while and see if there's anything going on. And if it wasn't, he would make contact. Uh, if, if there's something going on, then he would make contact, and he would have every right to ask for it. But in the, in the context of which you gave me, no, he doesn't have any right to ask him. And, and, It'd be like me coming up and asking him for his license as a federal agent. I do. I have no I reason do. to do so. Yeah. And so at the individual. I, well, I would agree. Again, you know, we, we have a right to be secure in our, in our persons and a reasonable expectation to his privacy. And I would not see how anyone could be forced or compelled to acquiesce to that request. Yeah, just on that one. That, that was it. Yes, ma'am? I don't have a question. Okay. okay. We're down to eight minutes. All right. So this is a question coming in from the, the internet. Uh, so Let's handle these it. first. Make sure that we've got all the questions out here. Before we I got okay, a so good this one. This is my question. Then. Um, Mr. Byers, do you uh, support the um, recent uh, Supreme Court's uh, overturning of Roe v. Wade, do you support that constitutionally? It's not a matter of whether I support it or not. It's the law. Uh, personally, are you asking me personally or yes. professionally? I'm, I'm, personally, I'm I don't support personally. it. Professionally, I do. Okay. That's how it works. There's a lot of laws that you're called on as a law enforcement officer to enforce that you may not agree with. That's not your job. Your job's not to enter, not to put your personal views and opinions into the administration of social control via law enforcement. That's not your job. Huh? That's gonna be hard. That's why there's so many bad cops. I, I, 
just want to give you an opportunity to clarify something because I'm a little bit confused. Okay. Uh, on one of your posts that I was reading, you said you were pro life? Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm pro life. Okay. All right. Well, I, then I misunderstood your answer just now. Okay. Does the yes, question please. need to be rephrased? Well, I, I no, I, I'm it sure I just made a mistake. Okay. Yes, Peter, you made a comment, and maybe I misheard you, and everybody can say you, you didn't hear it right. But you made a comment that the federal law supersedes the state law, mm -hmm. but on Roe v. Wade, it's thrown back to the state. Mm -hmm. So, so then the state, then you have to follow the state law as opposed to the federal law. Until federal law becomes promongulated if it does that at all. Yeah. It becomes a matter of law. Promongulated becomes law. If the federal law becomes promongulated that guarantees abortion, then that's that's we're back to square one with the Supreme Sovereign. Uh, but right now it's not. And I don't know how that's gonna happen. I have no way to know. And and see I, I again this is the difference between a republic versus democracy because I, I believe that that position is completely inaccurate given the Tenth Amendment where if a right is not specifically delineated in the U.S. Constitution, that right is given to the states or to the people. And in this case, the Supreme Court has said that right is not in the Constitution, therefore it is given to the states to make the decisions. So regardless of any federal law that could or could not be passed, the Supreme Court has already said that the Constitution gives the right to legalize or not legalize abortion to the states. So regardless of any federal law that is passed, the Supreme Court has already said it doesn't matter because it belongs to the states. And I would disagree with that in that it says that the laws that are not reserved by the federal government refer to the states. So the federal government takes them back and forth. In this case, it's reversed back to the states. And it may stay that way for all I know. I don't know. Ma'am, you had a question? I did. Uh, he said, uh, made a comment about that that's the, the comment was, that's the reason we have so many bad cops. Yes, ma'am. So, in your opinion, the majority of cops are bad? No, ma'am, I don't say they're bad. They're not corrupt, per se. It's just they have a hard time separating their professional selves from their personal selves. And that comes in... Uh, all sorts of things like PTSD, it comes into how they enforce specific laws, how they handle people, implicit bias, bias they don't even know they have on something, um, mental health issues. So on. annual training, annual training for police officers and for sheriff's department and for the jail employees should be <coughs> mandatory if it's not already. I know when I worked in a state prison, it was mandatory that we had the had certain uh, training every single year to like pound it into our heads yep. that we're not there to punish those people. We're there to maintain security. Yes, the current sir. sheriff in of the Clark Air County Marshals, is not maintaining did, training, by the way. In the Air Marshals, we did uh, 16 hours of uh, training. Uh, so we did that too. Yes, ma'am? This has nothing to do with the Constitution, but this is a question that's been emailed. There are people that have served their time in the jail, and they are not let out in a timely fashion. I've heard that a lot lately. Mm -hmm. So, their, their rights are being violated. Yes, ma'am, we sure are. So, what is that? Well, oh, I, I don't know about, I don't have any first-hand knowledge with those examples. They may exist. I, so well, like, I, for instance, Kamala Harris. She kept those people in jail so they could clean up her house. Oh, 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 okay. That so, kind of stuff. I mean, they've served their time, they had their 90 days, and now they're on day 120, and they're still out there cleaning up the highway because Kamala won't, won't let them out of jail. Well, that's so a clear violation of their their natural rights. I know. And so who's, who's going to fix it? comes under cruel and unusual punishment. One of the things I'd like to do as a sheriff is have a specific date for the criminal justice system, i.e. the judges, when they do their J and C or judgment committal order to come in, that has a specific date of their release. If not, then if there's any identifying data in that judgment and committal order, then we'll we'll uh, do it ourselves, and then within like 15 days, we'll send a letter to the to the judge saying this individual is due to be released. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. Two questions. Uh, 
Professionally, I, I professionally I would support the law. Personally, I, I disagree with it. Okay, yeah. going back to the AR, well, your the, your your term assault rifle. You said that if a law came down to where you needed to confiscate them, that you wouldn't. So, are, do you follow the law, or do you follow, the law follow your us. gut? I mean, because because with the Roe v. Wade, you said even Ma'am, though you didn't agree with it, you were going to support it. With the yes. guns, you said. Let me answer. I'll be glad. No, that's great. Okay. I, I, was just uh, I will support and enforce every Indiana state law there is. There is no Indiana state law against assault rifles. Okay. So if I'm not a fed, I'll be a state. Then. I'll be a uh, county employee. Okay. I'll okay. be your employee. Okay. In that case, why would I have one more question. Um, a representative, we were talking. Um, and he, of course, he, he's up north. And with January 6th, I don't. okay, Especially there was group, have a, no idea what they're talking about. somebody from his district the whole day. was there, didn't do anything, but the federal government actually showed up at their house to question them, to arrest them, to do whatever. The sheriff stepped in and said, you have no jurisdiction here. How would you handle the situation like that? No, well, I point. think that sheriff was wrong. They do have jurisdiction as a supreme sovereign. I wouldn't get involved with it, but I would, you know, if that happened here and I knew the individual... Now you said he was there and he got arrested, or they were questioning him and arresting him. Did they do both, or did he get, did they, he get they, arrested? They 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 were just going there. They they were harassing him. Actually, is did they, they arrest him? I don't know that they arrested him. Okay, let's they say for the sake of, him, let's say for the sake of argument that they were harassing and then arresting, and I'll answer both. Okay. If they were harassing him, he had every right to tell them to leave. And if they didn't leave, then he could call a local officer, either a local PD or a sheriff, to come out and talk to him. And if and they could tell him, hey, you've been trespassed, get out of here. You know, just because you have a federal badge doesn't mean that you're you're immune to state law. Let's say they arrested him. If they had probable cause to arrest him, then I would suggest to that individual that they use their due process and get an attorney. Okay, so did you want a chance to answer? Uh, I would agree. I mean, it, the federal there are allegedly federal laws broken. So, you know, it's up to the federal law enforcement to find out who broke those laws. And once he's arrested, he is supposed to have due process. Now, I think we have heard, we've all heard stories about due process not being provided to these individuals because of political. They're more political prisoners now. Yeah. Anything else. But, uh, but I, I don't think that the sheriff has the authority to uh, preemptively keep federal law enforcement from doing their job. So you're saying that the state police or the county police don't have the authority to be able to stand in the way if constitutional rights are being currently violated by another enforcement agency? I, I, to me, it did not sound like in this situation the constitutional rights are being violated. It, if the federal law enforcement had reasonable cause to believe that this person broke a federal law, they have the right to pursue that person and arrest him. If they did that, and they would I, have to have a warrant. Well, I, it, or no. probable cause. Probable right? cause. I agree with him, and when you added the stuff about an unconstitutional act, then I feel like it is the state and local uh, officers duty to step in and say this is unconstitutional you can't do this so as a sheriff you wouldn't have a problem sending one of your officers in the middle of something like that an fbi and just myself. at least check out myself. the investigation i would go myself i don't like the fbi i don't like secret service <laughs> well, look, but what would you do to talking to them, huh? mr byers what would you do when you got there in that situation if it was clearly an unconstitutional act i'd tell them it's unconstitutional you need to leave you're subject to arrest here they just got records of phone records. That's why they showed up. There was no, they were never, they were just in D.C. at the time. Yeah. That's all it was. Well, then they shouldn't really, they should say, why are you there and get an answer to leave. Yeah. People need to learn their own constitutional rights, too, which yeah. is great that we're yeah. all here. And that's the thing about constitutional rights. You, they're, they're worthless unless you stand up for them. Absolutely. If you don't stand up for them, they're just written on a, a piece of paper. Albeit a very old piece of paper, it's still just a piece of paper. Beautiful piece of paper. And not, and not to step on you, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, 
But I think that goes for the entire Constitution. And any time there's an assault on that Constitution, regardless of the letter that the person has after their name, we should stand up and defend the Constitution. And that, because it's that document that's providing us the opportunity to be here tonight. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think you've seen that Mr. Byers and I, we, we have some disagreements, but we have some agreements as well. But, you know, nobody's up here getting violent. Nobody's up here arguing. And this is, this is what that piece of paper guarantees us the right to do. Last question. We went through that here in Charlestown, very much so. There's about three people here that uh, would gladly tell you about the use of eminent domain as they tried to take their uh, their property during the last administration. Uh, eminent domain, and it's not a policing issue, but I will answer my personal opinion on it. I think it should be used very sparingly, very rarely, uh, and then only in times of, of extreme need. Uh, I, I believe in the free market. I think that if you want someone's property, you should pay them appropriately. Can I ask one question to follow up and kind of bring it all together? Uh, Mr. Colbert says the representative of the Republic to say democracy. Mr. Colbert said that democracy is basically mob rule. You say it's uh, keep with our representatives if we don't like what we are seeing around us or speak to our representatives for changes we want to be, to be made. And do you believe that it should be mob rule or should we? I don't believe it's mob rule. Um, I think it's 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 a messy rule at best when it's democracy, but I also know that there's other forms of, of a republic that aren't so messy that are pretty tyrannical. Uh, a monarchy, a monarchy with a parliament that can be pretty tyrannical. Um, I've seen that in some of the countries I've traveled to. I think that, uh, uh, and I, I, I agree that it's a republic, but we're a democratic republic. I think that's the best thing for it. And I, I, again, on a matter of semantics, I, I would disagree. There's never been a true democracy in the history of the world that did not degrade into tyranny at some point. Because it is mob rule, it is majority rule, and the majority has the ability to trample the individual rights and the natural rights of the individual. Thomas Jefferson said it would happen every three generations, regardless of if it was a democracy or a republic. Do you think that's true? Uh, well, I think uh, in the United States we've seen uh, we've seen it about every fourth generation, okay? And you know, and I think we're, we're there is a book out called The Fourth Turning, and uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think one of the things that we have been able to avoid that Thomas Jefferson talked about is watering that tree of liberty with the blood of patriots and tyrants. In other words, fight for it. I know, right? I'm getting, I'm getting old. <laughs> But uh, I do uh, believe that we've been lucky in that regard. Although there probably has been some blood, uh, I think we can look at the Civil War uh, as a two-sided coin. It, it ended one of the greatest travesties in human history, slavery. But at the same time, it was a baptism with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Would you also agree that the protesters have been shedding blood for that same that same uh, idealism? Which protesters? Depends on whatever, whatever you want you want to think of. Anyone who's been protesting that has been injured during protest, would you not agree that they are also fighting with bloodshed for their rights? I'd say that's on a case by case basis. And the other I, is I think there probably have been situations where uh, people were protesting correctly and within the law and shed blood, and that's, that's a tra tragedy. Uh, but I think also, uh, you know, let's look at Michael Byrd and uh, when he shot the unarmed Air Force veteran, Ashley Babbitt, in the Capitol, you know, that she she wasn't doing anything wrong. She was there, and she was unarmed. And an armed law enforcement officer shot her with absolutely no repercussion. Mm -hmm. That definitely should not have happened. Uh, we ran out of time. Do you guys mind if I ask one big question? <laughs>
It's just one, and it's it's you all can answer however you want. These clocks haven't been working anyway because you all been short answering and, <laughs> and other people have been questioning. But let's talk about the First Amendment just a little bit. Let's talk about our freedom to our speech, okay? Do either of you or both of you or separately, however you want to answer it, believe that it is the law enforcement's job to stop a protest? It, they're breaking the law, absolutely. I was just going to say, I wouldn't even do it unless there was somebody getting hurt. If somebody's getting hurt, I would stop it or try to at least intervene to get the person out of there. But no, I think that the pro protest, a a protest, a riot. Protest, protest has a long history here in the U.S. The difference I, I is law. If they're breaking the law, then it's a like riot. Said, if they're not if breaking they the law, it's hurt, then I would try to stop it or at least get the person out of there. Yeah, peaceful. They're peaceful. Yeah. The people aren't getting hurt. And then hurt. there's yeah. people who throw the word Of course, and, there very is. well said. And, and very well said. Behavior. Right. Very well so the said. difference uh, is my question still, like a follow up was going to be based on that. How do you differentiate? Is it by saying if this person is committing a crime during their protest, then would you act on that person, whereas the person right next to him maybe rode together there? If this person is not violating a crime, would you leave them the hell alone? Yes. And what do you think? If it's possible. Um, I, I'm afraid that in a situation like that, you, where you have a large crowd, again, I'm not a law enforcement officer. I've never been in that situation. It is a police debate, though. But, <laughs> uh, but to me, if I'm standing next to a guy that just threw a brick through a window, and I didn't touch that brick, it's going to be hard for a policeman standing across the street to know which one of us threw it. And if there's 10 of us around, it's going to be even harder. So he's going to have to look all 10 of us. Wouldn't he need to look at the probable cause to be able to enact? I, I would say that, number one, if he threw a brick and just did property damage, if it was a protest, I wouldn't get involved. If he threw a brick and hit somebody, then I'd get involved. I understand okay, so that. Someone, hold on, if I, huh? You're not going to protect personal property. You're in a protest? Business property. Business owners. You know, in a protest, I'll protect personal property from theft and that sort of stuff in a, in a protest situation. If I could see the person that threw the brick, and knew who it was, I'd go get him. Okay, so you, uh, wouldn't, you wouldn't conduct an interview, in, I'm sorry, like, excuse me, interview or, or even like any sort of trying to figure out who did what if someone vandalized If I saw it, my presence, saw him throw it, I wouldn't need to conduct an interview. Wouldn't need to give him a uh, Miranda rights. You would, yeah, would you make the arrest at that point, sir? Yeah, if I saw it. So if you saw it but with your I own didn't eyes. See who did it, if you had extended circumstances in which you could enact, then you would. Is that yes. what you're saying? If there was a group of 10 people and somebody threw a brick and I couldn't tell who it was, I'm not going to do anything. You're not going to disperse them. them. I'm sorry? You're going to disperse them. Even though you know this crowd yeah. is causing that yeah. chaos, yeah. you're not going to disperse no, them. No, would, I would try to disperse them, try to get them out of there, or at least break them up. You don't. You don't. But you, you don't have a right to be, to be told to leave to either. They don't have the right to tell us to leave. The They'll be like the officer. Here. The officer has to see it. If the officer doesn't so see that, it, at that point in time, it's no longer a peaceful protest. It's no longer what you're what you're protected against. Once you start vandalizing things, once you start hurting people, then that has now crossed the line. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. I've got a way to, to clarify this. Is it an individual basis? like an individual that's violating law versus a person that's at the protest, is it an individual person by person basis, the law enactment, is it by individuals or is it collectively as a group? I don't understand your question, please. Well, it, 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 again, I think this goes to the heart of our initial discussion. Are we looking at the individual or are we looking at a collective mob? Are we looking at a mob of people who are being empowered to destroy personal and public property and it doesn't matter if it's one person that does it or if it's ten they you should be held accountable for the destruction of that property okay. if there are ten people here and one person destroys property and I know it was one of these ten people law enforcement needs to question and interview Every one of those 10 people. My question was, you're going to get rid of all 10 people, or are you going to just find the one that was guilty? I'm going to detain all 10 until I find the one that did it. So, guys, look, if I commit disorderly no. right now, none of y'all get to be here. No. You know what I mean? But that's the way you're saying it. If I committed a disorderly right now, if I violated an Indiana crime, 
what you all are saying when you say get rid of the whole group, that's a Ninth Amendment violation, by the way. That is saying all of you all have to leave based on Chris's action. But is that fair to you? But you won't have to leave because you all have to be processed. Well, that's what protects it, right? Right. Which is the question and I was I asking. No problem going. It was that guy. <laughs> there you go. But, you're, but then you fall back to his question, which was if, if he doesn't like somebody and just lies to the cops and says, this guy. And then you, then you probably think of everyone around here. So what's my protection? What's my protection that separates you from being punished for my crime? All of us there is no figure you. No, that wasn't. That doesn't work. It's called hearsay. If I don't admit it, you all can't do that. Uh, and that's a Fifth Amendment violation. But I'll tell you what the answer is. Due process, the law. If you have any he has questions for Officer John, will stick around. If you have any questions for me, I'm going to stick around. Thank you, Chris. That was great, guys. Thank you, guys. Both very of you, very nice smart. Job, guys. Good questions from the crowd, too. Yes, I like this guy right here. He's smart. Okay. <laughs> well done, fellas. <laughs> Sorry, the timer wasn't doing it good. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you to uh, the couple of you that hung out in here with me, even though my screen was turned Thank around wrong, sure. and I wasn't able to read the comments and stuff because I was trying to keep an eye on the two He's phones got a fairly here. decent stance so, uh, on the uh, I will catch you all later. It would help if you all both. No, that's right. Due process is such a big one. And it, it, a lot of people can't call it. No, the whole crowd was confused about it. They think that you're going to violate Ninth Amendment by punish the right for what I do. You can't do that by the Constitution. You can wait till September comes sit down with you and your wife. All right, guys. So, here. Let me see if I can flip this around. You had some great questions, buddy. Wow, it's really close. No, but you had really great questions. Thank you guys for uh, coming nice in and watching the live. And some I, I questions that for not really being able to read what everybody has put in the chat. Yeah. You guys are awesome, and we will try to go live again here in a little bit. That way we can talk to everybody. And whoever did the uh, $5 super chat, you're awesome. Have a good night, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah.